Hello, everyone. My name is Kyori Kim, and I'm one of the social media section editors of the Archives of Plastic Surgery. I'm excited to introduce Heart of the Press. Twice a month, we'll be hosting Heart of the Press with one of the authors of the latest APS paper and two panelists. It offers you a special opportunity to directly hear from the authors and join an insightful discussion between panelists. You can also leave your thoughts as a comment for further discussion. Welcome to our cards of plastic surgery, Heart of the Press. Uh, today I'm joined by Drs. Ray, Dr. Suruya, and Yasmina Samaha from uh, Cedar uh, Sinai Medical Center. And today we'll be discussing three dimensional video microscopy, potential for improved ergonomics without increased operative time. So, without further ado, and also uh, we, I'm joined by Dr. Kim and Dr. Perez from Korea and uh, Peru. So first we will start with the discussion. Um, you know what, so, sorry guys, I'll just redo this. <laughs> it's so many names, okay, I'll do this again. Okay, hi everyone, welcome to Archives Plastic Surgery, Hot of the Press. Uh, today I'm joined by Dr. Ray, Dr. Suruya, and Yasmina Samaha from um, Cedar sinai Medical Center, and my social section ed editors, Dr. Kim and Dr. Perez from Korea and Peru. And today we'll be discussing three-dimensional video microscopy, potential for improved ergonomics without increased operative time. Thank you and very we'll much. Pause here, and then we'll uh, share the PowerPoint. Thank you for the opportunity to present our article in this edition of Hot of the Press. Today we're going to talk about 3D video microscopy, potential for improved ergonomics without increased operative time. Microvascular surgery has come a long way in the past 60 years since it was first introduced in the worm. Surgical loops and operating microscopes are typically used to perform microvascular anastomosis and establish a magnified view of the surgical field. However, surgical microscopes have been associated with increased ergonomic stress due to sustained static postures and hyperflexion of the cervical spine for prolonged periods of time. A survey of plastic surgeons reported that almost 80% experience musculoskeletal symptoms, most commonly neck pain and low back pain. It has also been re reported that using a microscope for more than three hours per week can lead to these musculoskeletal problems. Newer biomedical devices, such as 3D video microscope, also known as exoscopes, have emerged as an alternative to the classic operating microscope. The 3D exoscope was first introduced in the field of neurosurgery. At our institution, one of the earliest reports of this technology used in neurosurgery came out in 2008, and our surgical colleagues have been pioneers in surgical endoscopy since it was first introduced more than 50 years ago. Ortel and Burkhard later described the application of the exoscope in cranial and spinal procedures in 2017. The authors noted comparable image quality to the standard operating microscope and an excellent comfort level for all procedures performed with the exoscope. These devices substitute the optics of a standard microscope with a stereo video camera. The resulting image is projected onto a high resolution monitor that can be viewed in three dimensions using polarized 3D glasses. 3D exoscopes are thought to improve posture and decrease musculoskeletal strain. The neurosurgery experience suggests that these devices may provide a widely applicable alternative to binocular scopes, though some studies have suggested that operative times are longer. Dr. Bercy, who invented the video bronchoscope in 1962 and authored one of the earliest papers on video exoscopes, is a professor emeritus of surgery here at Cedars. So we launched a pilot study between 2020 and 2021, looking at my free flap experience using the 3D exoscope and the binocular scope. Our center is a 900 bed facility and teaching hospital with 10 microsurgeons across three different surgical specialties. Our IRB approved this study and patient consent was obtained to gather data about these operations. Of the 20 mic microsurgical cases that I did during this one year period, we observed nine free flaps performed with the exoscope 
and 11 with the standard binocular microscope. Our group sought to investigate whether exoscopes prolong ischemia time and whether they offer an ergonomic advantage to the standard operating microscope. So these figures demonstrate the operating room setup. The principal surgeon and assistant are each standing in a position of comfort, facing a 3D monitor that is behind the other surgeon. The images on the video monitors are rotated and positioned to provide an unobstructed view, enabling all participants wearing special polarized eyewear to experience a magnified view of the surgical field. So this is the scrub text view. Uh, the surgeon and the assistant are both standing comfortably. Each member of the team, uh, as I said, is wearing polarized eyewear to see the 3D view on these portable monitors. The exoscope has a footprint that's similar to, maybe a little smaller than the binocular microscope, but the monitors do occupy a fair amount of space on their own. So as I mentioned, we identified 20 patients who underwent free flap reconstructions between 2020 and 2021, including the first nine performed with an exoscope, and those are shown here. Uh, there were unilateral and bilateral deep flaps, uh, radial forearm flaps, as well as one ALT. So these are the cases performed with a standard operating microscope. The total average uh, ischemia time was not really significantly different between uh, the different flaps performed with the 3D exoscope and the standard binocular microscope. So the type of uh, microscope was not a significant predictor of ischemia time for radial forearm free flap phalloplasties, uh, which is one of the index cases we looked at. Uh, the exoscope taking about 195 minutes versus the standard microscope, 154 minutes. I do want to mention that the ischemia time included here um, also includes the time to inset of the phalloplasty flap during which there's a pretty prolonged period of ischemia. So this isn't all time that we were under the microscope. Uh, and ischemia times were also similar using either scope for uh, DIEP flaps uh, in reconstruction. And we, we looked at uh, each side or the unilateral uh, flap just to standardize our approach to um, comparing these, uh, uh, the amount of ischemia time. So it was about 83 minutes for the exoscope and 94 minutes uh, using the standard microscope. So I would pose to you that the exoscopes offer an ergonomic alternative to binocular scopes and microvascular surgery. Uh, we found that even during the learning phases, uh, 3D scopes do not noticeably prolong ischemia time. In fact, our times were actually slightly shorter for deep flaps, although none of these differences reached statistical significance. And exoscopes do have some advantages. Uh, stereopsis, which is uh, perception of depth is very good. Uh, there's very little heat generated by the LED light source compared to some of the older microscopes that, that still use uh, incandescent uh, and halogen light bulbs. All members of the team, trainees and observers, can see the 3D screens uh, if, if positioned appropriately and if they're wearing the same eyewear. Uh, but there are some also some uh, uh, disadvantages of using exoscopes. Uh, anecdotally, some observers do get a little dizzy or, or get headaches using the 3D glasses. We did not observe this, but this is uh, reported in the literature. Uh, the setup of the video screens um, does take up space in the operating room, and it does take up time. That's an important factor as well. Uh, some authors uh, who've looked at exoscopes and other surgical specialties have found that their operating times were longer, uh, and the cost of the exoscope is not negligible. In US dollars, it's anywhere from $250,000 to 1.5 million. So I attended medical school at the Mayo Clinic. And during my time there, I learned some of the timeless wisdoms of the brothers Mayo. Uh, these were surgeons who helped found the, the Mayo Clinic as we know it today. The older of the two, William Mayo, once said, the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. And all of us who practice surgery know what he means. Our patients put their lives and well-being in our hands, and it's our responsibility to make the best decisions for them. The younger of the brothers, Charlie, was a little more down to earth, and, and people say he was more approachable. Toward the end of his career, he was once quoted as saying, the object of all health education is to change the conduct of individual men, women, and children by teaching them to care for their bodies well. So, and this point applies to surgeons themselves. We have to care for our bodies if we want to have a long career and not experience chronic pain. 
So I would conclude by saying that whether or not we have learned ways to protect our health as surgeons, I think we're all aware of the issue of work-related musculoskeletal injury and surgery. I mean, plastic surgeons are among those who are great, uh, at greatest risk of these problems. Um, and this has kind of come to attention in the last few years at uh, specialty meetings and um, committees are set up in all the great uh, in all the big um, uh, medical organizations to address issues of ergonomic, um, uh, non-ergonomic injuries. So ultimately, adopting these technologies like the exoscope, along with other human factors, may better protect our career longevity and the health of our surgical workforce. So I just want to take a minute to recognize my incredible partners in the Division of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery here at Cedars-Sinai in Los Angeles. Each of these people is a caring and talented surgeon who is among the top in their field, and I feel honored and humbled every day that I work with them. I also want to thank Yasmina and all the other students, residents, and fellows that I've mentored for their hard work in both research and clinical excellence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ray and Yasmina for sharing this very important work uh, because, you know, recently in the ASRM as well, a lot of meetings start talking about ergonomic importance of ergonomics for microsurgeons. And I'm sure a lot of us know that someone, a microsurgeon who had a cervical fusion or different types of issues, back issues just because of that. And I think it's a very really important work to share. Uh, I know, Dr. Ray, you are the uh, Director of Microsurgery Fellowship at Cedars-Sinai. Uh, and then my question for you is that, how do you um, teach um, like the new micro, uh, the microsurgery fellows or residents or uh, the faculty who are interested in doing this uh, procedure? What is the learning curve and how, uh, what are kind of like the learning process for those who want to adopt this as a part of their uh, tool? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, you know, all the times that I was using this exoscope, it might've been my first time. It was also the trainee's first time. And I do the, all these cases with either a fellow or a resident, sometimes both. Sometimes it's the resident and the fellow doing the case, doing most of the microsurgery together. Um, so it, there's a little bit of a learning curve. I think, um, you know, I, the best thing to do is ahead of time, grab the exoscope, it's portable. So we, we can move it to different parts of the hospital. We actually have a simulation center in, in our facility, which is state of the art. It's a great place. It has uh, mock-ups of the operating room. So we can actually set up our exoscope. We have a training binocular microscope in that same facility. So it's a good place to practice your skills before you go live and, and do this on a real patient. And that's, that's what I've done. That's what I have my trainees do if they're gonna be using the scope just to get used to it. Um, I don't think the learning curve is very steep for me anyway, um, it does take a little bit getting used to looking at a 3D image on what is essentially a TV screen. Um, but unlike laparoscopy where, you know, for those of us who are old enough to have trained doing a lot of laparoscopy in their general surgery years, um, you know, you had to kind of contort your body. You had to look at a computer screen that was flat, wasn't three dimensional. There was no, you know, perception of depth. Um, you had to sometimes imagine a mirror image because the screen did not mirror itself. So all of those problems are kind of alleviated with these dual monitor setups that you have um, so that the image is rotated so that each surgeon sees the correct orientation, which is pretty critical when you're doing microsurgery. Um, but anyway, to answer your question, I would say, you know, I think the important thing is to first get the, uh, the trainee's hands on the equipment. So let them try it out. Um, in a simulated environment, once they get comfortable with that, it's actually not not much of a stretch to bring it into the operating room, but it does take a little time to learn. Gotcha. And then before I, uh, other uh, panelists will have a question, I have a question. So I do a lot of lymphedema surgery and the breast reconstruction, <laughs> and the uh, the vein of our existence is always the kind of immediate uh, lymphatic reconstruction or prophylactic lymphovenous bypass, which is quite in the up in the axilla. And I, I noticed that you use it for the breast reconstruction, which is also in a hole as well. Mm -hmm. And have anyone in your practice have experience of using it um, in the uh, uh, axilla or uh, like uh, for uh, lymphatic purposes? And then uh, what's the utility in that? Yeah, that, that's one thing we haven't tried. And I think super microsurgery, where you're using submillimeter structures that you're trying to suture, is probably going to be a challenge with, with anything, uh, any type of um, microscopy, just because any bit of vibration, when you have that degree of magnification, 
um, can be difficult to control. So the, there are um, image stabilizers built into these things. There are, the base is very heavy and solid, maybe not quite as heavy as a, as a standard binocular microscope. So there's a little bit of vibration. I don't think I would um, necessarily expect it to perform as well when you get into magnific ma magnifications greater than 10x. Um, but we haven't tried it. Um, you know, so that that question remains open. And, you know, we actually have an IRB approved study to look at uh, maybe stretching the limits of what we would normally use these scopes for. So that question may be answerable. Um, but it definitely, I will say, as far as working in a hole like the axilla or in the chest when you're doing a deep flap, it's actually performed very well because the nice thing is that the head of the scope is very adjustable. It doesn't have as much bulk to it as, um, as I would say the, like for example, the Leica microscope that we use or the Mataka microscope that some of my colleagues use. It's not as bulky. It's got a smaller head on it and you can be moved around so that it's not in your way. So actually looking into a hole is, is not that hard. You don't have to turn the whole scope and then turn your head to look through the eyepiece. You just turn the camera and you're still standing in the same position. So that's kind of nice. Um, the depth perception is a little bit different. Um, I would say it's similar to the uh, optical microscopes, but um, sometimes things are a little out of focus. You don't have quite the same depth. So especially as you zoom in, and I think this is just an optical property of microscopes in general, the more you zoom in, the less depth of field you have. And so you kind of have to prepare yourself for that. Um, and sometimes I'm sewing nerves in a deep hole, like when I'm sewing the clitoral nerve on a phalloplasty, it can be a little bit of a challenge, um, you know, with, with any type of scope, but we've done it very easily with this one. And I, I would say it's definitely no more challenging than with a binocular scope. Thank you. Um, it's quite interesting to see, like, you know, when new technology comes out, you always want to hear from the earlier doctors, how is this going to work <laughs> uh, before Absolutely. we jump in? Um, I know Dr. Surya also joins us from Caesars Mind uh, Sinai, and then uh, I know you do peripheral nerve surgery. So I was wondering what's your experience on it, and if you could share your wisdom of using the scope. Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, personally, I haven't yet uh, trialed the exoscope either than one, one case with Dr. Ray, um, but I do have some questions related to it. You know, first off, I just wanted to congratulate you and uh, medical student Samaha on, you know, what I think is a courageous study in terms of exploring something innovative out of the box where you may not necessarily have a comfort for it, and yet you're willing to explore it. Um, I think it's fertile ground for future studies, and, and I definitely, in looking at the study, had some interesting questions that I hope you can answer, or at least uh, uh, a warrant further exploration. Uh, in terms of the ischemia time, I noticed that the first five cases versus the next four with the exoscope had progressively decreasing ischemia times, and I'm wondering if you could shed some insight uh, for the beginners who first trialed this type of exoscope what are some of the pitfalls or some, what, some of the pearls that you've learned over the course of the cases that allowed you to cut down in your ischemia time? <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it boils down to the, um, to the setup preoperatively and making sure that that's all um, done correctly so that you're not pausing during the case to try to correct the position of the monitors, which adds time to the, to the case as well. The other thing actually that probably slowed me down a little more in the beginning in the first few cases we did was um, some of these scopes like the Synaptive, which is the one that we, we used the majority of the time, although we did also trial the Olympus. Uh, the Synaptive um, has voice controls um, and it does take a little getting used to because you have to wear a microphone and it's listening to your voice for the commands. Um, so it was a little clunky at first because I was more interested in just jumping and do the microsurgery and less concerned about how this thing worked and, and how I could manipulate it. So I ended up having to do the manual override, you know, grab the camera and move it around instead of using my voice control. Um, they also give you, some of these devices have like a, a stylus, a pointer that you can use and it'll, it'll the camera, the sensor will track where your stylus is and focus on that area. So you don't have to grab the scope and move it. Um, so that added a little bit of time in the beginning when I wasn't used to those features. Um, so, um, I don't know that that was where all the extra ischemia time went, but sometimes working with some trainees, some trainees are, are a little more um, dynamic about adapting to newer technology than others. Um, so there, there's a few factors that go into it, but I do think that once it's set up and ready to go, there's very little difference in terms of how efficient you can be and how easily you can operate. If anything, I would argue that because you don't have so many buttons and things to adjust and you're just looking at a screen, I would say that the... Um, 
you know, the utility of this is probably easier for a trainee who's not used to using a microscope at all. Got it. And I think you alluded to this before, but I'm just curious, you know, in terms of the uh, best fit cases for this versus may not necessarily be a good fit, can you comment a little bit on that microvascular versus microneural uh, contrast in terms of, did you find that, uh, you know, for me personally, when I'm doing microneural surgery, uh, understanding the features of fascicle versus epineurium, getting that feedback, that um, both haptic feedback, but then also the uh, color feedback of knowing where I am is quite important. And I'm just wondering yeah. if you felt like there were any limitations or advantages with the exoscope. Yeah, no, and I would love for, you know, a, a skilled ner um, nerve surgeon like you to give me their feedback after using it. But I would say, you know, since I do some neurorophies um, with uh, with these innervated phalloplasties and some deep flaps, although I'm not usually doing the neurorophies on those cases, I would say um, I found it to be very similar to the optical microscope. I haven't found any particular challenges. I'm maybe not as um, adept as identifying all structures as you are. Uh, but, um, there is some difference in the color of the image. You know, anytime you have a video, um, projection of, of an image of a surgical field, there's going to be some differences. And I think sometimes at first it can take some getting used to everything looks very red or slightly orange tinted when you're using these video scopes. Luckily, there's a lot of ways to adjust it. So you can adjust the saturation on the video image. So it's not quite so, you know, glowing, uh, and not quite so bright. So if that's something that's hard for your eyes to adjust to, you can do that manually. Um, I think once you get used to it, the redness of it doesn't really bother you so much. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it, but it just looks very red. Um, but the contrast is good and I can see the vessels and I can see nerves very easily. Uh, as, as we were alluding to before, I don't know that um, lymphatic cases would necessarily be possible, but I don't know that they're not possible until we try it out. So as far as limitations and what cases I wouldn't use it on, um, and actually probably the bigger issue for me is not so much what type of operation, it's also what space we're in. Because there is some space that's needed to set up these monitors, I would say if you have small operating rooms or if you if you have an option of working in a bigger versus a smaller space, you know you definitely need the bigger space. And at our facility, and Mitch knows this, you know we have some pretty small operating rooms. So there's certain rooms in our in our hospital I would not use this equipment. It just it would just be very very uncomfortable to try to do that. Um, so I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yeah, it does. I just have one more question for you, if if I may. Um, you know, obviously uh, for me, I'm hyper aware when it comes to the impact of the tolls of the operating room on our body. You know, as a peripheral nerve surgeon, I'm constantly evaluating patients with either peripheral and or cervical radiculopathy. Um, I was actually at Georgetown when Dr. Davison and Parikh reported on the occupational hazards of microsurgery. And I was just wondering from the standpoint of future studies, I could see a lot of uh, fruitful uh, data that can come out of this in terms of looking at uh, validated questionnaires, whether it be DASH, Promise Metrics, to evaluate the comparison of a cohort of microsurgeons utilizing the exoscope versus the micro, uh, standard microsurgery scope. And I'm just wondering what ideas you have for that in the future. And thank yeah, you. Yeah, so we, you know, I alluded to it before, but we do have an IRB approved project that we have not yet initiated, but we'll hopefully, uh, we'll be embarking on that soon since we do have a simulation center or we can either you know, observe surgeons in the operating room doing this in real time, or we can try to create simulated tasks. There's different ways we could do that. Um, but yeah, we, we actually have found a few questionnaires that have been validated. Um, for example, NASA has a Likert scale type survey of certain ergonomic um, tasks that have to be completed and then you know, uh, scoring your amount of pain and discomfort and awkwardness that you experience during those tasks. Um, and afterwards. So we we have those um, built into our study, um, you know, but there's, and, and really when it comes down to it, patient reported outcomes or subject reported outcomes are really important to, to make a final point on how feasible and how successful these technologies are at preventing workplace injuries and workplace chronic pain. So I think your point is very good that we need to study this on a bigger scale. We need to look at different surgeons, not just a single surgeon experience. We need to have people who've never used this technology before, see how quickly they adopt it, 
see how how they feel that it helps their practices, um, how willing they are to adopt it. Because I'll be honest, probably the biggest barrier to this study is recruiting surgeons to do it. People don't like to try new things always, um, you know, especially when they're happy the way they do it, even if they don't realize that it's causing them injury. Um, and, you know, surgeons are also busy, which is the other limitation of that study, which is we have to get people out of the operating room sometimes to get them to the sim center and spend an hour doing, you know, doing an extra task in their already long day. Uh, but maybe if we study them in the operating room and we have them follow up with questionnaires, that could be another way to do it. It's a little tough to just introduce this kind of technology where you would normally use a scope unless somebody's kind of prepared themselves for it. So, so that would be one limitation of that approach. Thank you very much and congratulations again on the study. Thanks, Mitch. Any other thoughts uh, or questions? We'll yeah. With Dr. Kim, because uh, I think she does the gender affirming surgeries as well. So I think she will have questions regarding um, how to use the scope for the phalloplasty. Yeah, first of all, congratulations on your work. I think a lot of micro, young microsurgeons, especially they are very excited about this new technology. Actually, a lot of questions I like I was thinking about is already answered, like a working space, technology, the monitor, color difference, those kind of things. Uh, I just want to hear the actual experience. So the neck pain, back pain, are you, do you really think it's good for the ergonomics? Yeah, I think, you know, like anything else, you still have to be um, aware of your body position because it's easy to slouch and it's easy to be in a bad position operating, you know, even if you're using optimal equipment, just like when you're sitting at a desk, there's good posture, bad posture. So I do, you know, I have found myself slouching during surgery and have to kind of correct my posture. Some of that is because, you know, we're so focused on the task at hand that we don't really think about the ergonomics of our tasks in front of us. But if you're uh, mindful of it, um, you actually can um, walk out of the operating room after using this thing for an hour or two and, and feel a lot more um, or a lot less uncomfortable. I've noted that myself. I know that's very subjective. That's not a high level of evidence. We need to have more um, objective measures of that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but honestly, I have to say, you know, having used the microscope for many years and now having tried the exoscope, I think that it's, it's technology that will bring something to the table. I think it's just a matter of whether we can get surgeons to try it out because it is unconventional. It is something that's relatively new and different. It's expensive. Um, as this technology uh, improves, the cost will come down. People will buy used devices off the, you know, off, off the market and not necessarily have to pay full price. And that'll bring the technology to smaller institutions that maybe don't have the same budgets as bigger hospitals. Um, I think that there's going to be some newer technology with artificial intelligence now becoming a reality and affecting our everyday lives. You know, it'll be able to track your movements better. It'll be able to zoom in, zoom out, um, anticipating your your actions so that you don't even have to use voice commands most of the time. I think those kinds of technologies are going to really make this more attractive. The binocular microscope is great, but you know, it's a very mechanical instrument. It's something that over time I think will will start to feel less and less um, natural and um, intuitive, especially as the younger generation comes up being very used to the conveniences of mobile electronic devices that, that kind of anticipate your movements and your actions. So I think, I think there is an exciting future for this technology. And, and I haven't found any significant limitations. I haven't tried to do super microsurgery. That's the one thing I think that we touched upon that is yet to be tested. I have some concerns about it because of the vibrations of the, of the device. But short of that, I think, I think this, is, uh, this could be the way of the future. We'll see. <laughs> and then uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll end with Dr. Perez's question. Hi. Congratulations for your paper, it's, it's really good. And um, well, actually here in Peru, we just have Leica and size. I don't think they are going to come um, soon, this exoscope, but um, I have a question. Um, so do you, um, you say about the, that you have to move the exoscope if you want to do it, like change the camera or something. So. Do you got like um, any control yourself in the during the operation to manage that, or other person have to move it for you? Yeah, so there's, um, I mean, obviously different companies on the market that are producing these devices. Um, I'll speak to the ones that I've used. All of them have manual controls, like you can actually grab the head of the microscope and move it around. 
Um, it's, you know, there's a, there's a sterile covering on it. So you don't necessarily have to have a, an assistant do it for you. Um, some of these devices have foot pedals. Some of them have the stylus, which basically has a reflective material on it. That's easy for the camera and the sensors to see. So they can adapt the angle of the scope and they can zoom in and out based on voice commands and based on the position of the stylus. So it looks at the axis of the stylus and it kind of adjusts the angle of the scope based on the direction that you're holding it. So there's, you know, it, it's a pretty powerful tool when you're trying to make fine adjustments in your microscope and you're trying to find a different angle. Maybe you're looking around some anatomic structure or just trying to position in a way that you get a better view. So it's, you know, it's very easy for a single surgeon to, to change the direction and, and zoom in and out and not have to have an assistant do that for them. Okay. And the next question is, what aspects should be considered in future studies to evaluate the use of 3D exoscopes compared to the standard binocular surgical microscope and microvascular surgery? Yeah. I mean, I think the two big things are, you know, making it as easy to adapt to as possible for surgeons. It's like I said, we're, we're creatures of habit. We don't like to try new things unless we're really convinced that it's going to make our practice better and make our job easier. Um you know, I think that that's the number one. And then number two is, you know, we need to figure out how to get the cost down and how to make it more readily available to people who are doing microsurgery. Because loops, you know, and, and even a relatively inexpensive uh, binocular microscope are much less expensive and much easier to get a hold of. And, you know, that's kind of our go-to. That's our default. Okay. Thank you so much. Right. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, everyone, for um, first, again, congratulate, um, I congratulate Dr. Ray and Yasmina for fantastic work. And thank you again for sharing your experience with us. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining this fantastic discussion. Be sure to tune in for other articles we'll be discussing on future Heart of the Press. You can also connect to the Global Plastic Surgery Society through our YouTube channel, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are looking forward to meeting you on our APS social media. Let's be social.